we start assembly, the first thing is, of course, what? Inserting components, right? That is very important. So let's say here, I want to insert three components for a pendulum as like per our lecture. So I have a pendulum, I have a support, and I have a pin. So the first step is let's insert these three components. And uh, if we go on Canvas under Modules and scroll down to uh, Demo Files, you can see these three files. So you don't need to make them from scratch. I already made them. Just download them and practice. So I download the pendulum, that's that SLDPRT, then the pen, and then the support. Okay, so I got the three. Now I go back to SolidWorks. I start a new, but I go to new assembly. And I okay that. There we go. So now we are in the assembly environment and immediately opens up the browse window and asking us to insert the components. So if uh, I close this, I want to show you where to uh, get them also from the commands on the top. So if you go to the assembly tab, the command that you need to push to get the browse window is this guy. So just click on insert components, go to wherever you got your parts and then get the parts. So let's first get the support or it doesn't matter. Let's first get the pendulum and bring it in, right? You can bring all of them together too, if you want to, and then bring the rest of them too. So here is one and this is the other one. Okay. So first bring all components then. Typically, many of the assemblies, they have a fixed component. If they have any moving part, they typically also have a ground or a fixed component. Here, it's this support one. If it's a structure, then everything is fixed. But in this case, out of these three components, the support part, this guy is fixed. But uh, how do I know or uh, basically how can I fix it or how can I make it movable? How do I know if it's fixed or not at all? If you look at the tree in front of these three components, two of them have parentheses and inside the parentheses there is a dash sign. One of them has F inside the parentheses. F means fixed and dash means they are available to move. We call them they are floating, okay? They are movable. So in this case, instead of the support being the fixed part, SolidWorks made the uh, pendulum the fixed part. Why? Because that's the default of SolidWorks. The first component that you insert into assembly, SolidWorks makes it fixed and the rest of them float. But you can change that, no worries. You just right click on this and say what? Float. Then right click on the support and say what? fix so now it is the right order how can i check whether something is moving or not and how can i move them well you go here under move component if you want to translate them or you expand it and what rotate them if you want to change the orientation so if i click on here you see this one i can easily drag this one i can easily drag but look at this one nothing happens and it tells you that the selected component is fixed Okay, and the same thing for rotation. I can click on this, go rotation, and then what? I can rotate them. Now, rotation, if you don't do it about the right axis, could be a little bit tricky, but uh, I'll talk about them more. So first, I got the three components, made sure that um, the fixed one is fixed and the moving ones are all float. Now, it's time to what? To do what we call mate, add mates, or basically add constraints. So in general, when you have an object in the space, as you know from your probably physics course, or uh, hopefully some of you have dynamics or had dynamics, or you will at, in the future, an object in the space can have six different types of motion. We call them what? Degrees of freedom okay so each object has 
uh, six degrees of freedom. What are they? So you can move along X axis here, Y axis, and then what? Z axis. Then also you can what? You can rotate about what? X axis. Look at that. You can rotate about Y axis. Or you can rotate about Z axis. Okay, so you have three rotations and what? Three what we call translations. Okay, there are all sorts of uh, rotations about three axes and uh, moving along three axes. So six degrees of freedom. But if we are going to make a pendulum, then your pendulum should not be completely free to move. Why? Because you know when you have a pendulum, the pendulum does not move along any axis x, y, z, and it does not rotate about any arbitrary axis. All it does rotate about is the axis of rotation, right? The axis of this pin. So out of all six degrees of freedom that the pendulum has, only one of them should be left. The other five should be taken away. How do you take away degrees of freedom? By adding constraints which in cat software we typically call those mates okay so you make some parts with some other parts concentric some parts coincident with each other perpendicular tangent you do a lock you uh, add a distance you add angle and so many other things right so in this case here what do i need well first i want this face of the uh, back of the pendulum to be what? On the top of this face of the support. Now in real life, you don't put them exactly on the top of each other. You give them a little bit of gap so that there is not a huge friction. But I'll show you all cases. So first, if you say it's ideal and there is no friction, I want that face and then hold down control and this face, these two guys to be what? On the top of each other, we say, they are coincident, right? So how do I do that? I click on mate and then it says which quantities to mate. I say this one and then what? This one. And then typically it gives you the best option that it thinks itself. So out of all different options, you see here, it gave me the coincidences. Is that what you want? You say yes, you okay that. And now if you look, the pendulum cannot move freely. Let me show you. It can move as long as, let me show you from the top view. It can move as long as this coincidence is not violated. So now if I want to uh, violate this coincidence and move the pendulum away or toward the support, it's not going to happen. This coincidence has to stay. So now out of uh, Three different ways that this pendulum can move one of them which is motion here actually along z perpendicular to the support plane is gone also i cannot rotate it any way i want if you see here i can rotate it in the plane but if i want to rotate it so basically about the z axis but if i want to rotate it about x or about y axis it's not going to happen so out of six degrees of freedom this Coin, this coincidence, which basically makes the motion of this pendulum to be only on this plane, we call it a planar constraint, it took three out of six degrees of freedom off. It, take, it took one translation and two rotations off. So now you are down to what? Two translations and one rotation. Rotation about Z and motion or translation about X and Y, along X and Y. The other thing you want, you click on mate and you want these two holes to also be on the top of each other, I mean axially, so we call it concentric. So you choose this one and then you choose this one and again it gives you the best option, concentric. And you accept it. Now the pendulum cannot move anymore. Okay, If you click on pendulum you cannot move it anyways. You can only what? Rotate it about the axis. And that is exactly what you want. So now only one rotation is left. Five degrees of freedom are gone and only one left. So that's exactly what I want. And now you apply it for the pin. 
Okay, so you apply for the pin, you click on the pin, and you say, I want this surface to be coincident with the inner surface of the hole. And then I also want this front surface to be coincident with the front face of the pendulum. And there we go. Okay, so now you have a pendulum assembly. You can click on move component or rotate and clearly see that it behaves the way it should. Okay, so this is a simple assembly. As we go further on, I'll show you more and more. Okay, so we have a bunch of different things that we can do. Now, uh, let's talk about accessing and modifying the mates. So here, if you see on the tree, I have an assembly, which is the whole thing. I also have what? Each individual component, I can expand them and see what's inside them. And I'll show you later, I can access them and modify them right here. And then I also have a tab called mates. And here are all the mates or constraints that I have applied. If I don't like them, I want to delete them or modify them. All I need is to simply what? Do a right click. And then either delete or what? Edit feature. Or I can suppress them if I want to. So you see here, I said, uh, I'll put the front face of the support and the back face of the pendulum on the top of each other. And in real world, that's typically not what you do because there is friction between the surfaces and they are touching each other. So one other way that people do it is instead of that, they give them a small gap. Okay, very small gap so that the friction does not exist. So instead of coincidence, you make them parallel and what parallel, the best way is to provide what? A distance, a gap. And here you provide some gap. You say like 0.1 mil. Okay. And okay that. So now if I see it from the side view, they are not perfectly on the top of each other. You clearly see the 0.1 mil gap between them. And that is sufficient for me to what? To avoid the friction. Okay, so you can do a, a distance mate instead of what? A coincidence mate, right? So that's going to be a lot helpful in real life. And I save it, and I save it. Pendulum assembly. Okay, so whatever you want, you can right-click Delete, Edit, or Suppress. Uh, now, one important thing is this. When you do have assemblies and you're constraining your parts, never over-constrain. Okay, if you over-constrain and you make the part over-constrained so it has more than needed constraints, SOLIDWORKS is not going to like it. It's like when you over-define your sketches, right? Remember, the sketch went uh, red or yellow and it didn't like it. So the same thing with assembly. Do not add more than needed, okay? So I have to add something for you here and make sure that never over-constrain your assembly okay this is very very important extremely important and i'll show you an example right now okay Okay, very important. I guess I have to do it like that. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, let's say here, or when some constraints contradict each other, that could be bad too. 
So here I said that this back face with the front face of the support should have a gap between them. Now I come and add something else. Like what? Like for example, you see I made this front face with this one coincident. And since I made the length of the pin such that it was fit to the sum of the two thicknesses, the back of the pin has a little bit gap with the back plane. So if I come and say, hey, also make this face and this face what for me? Coincident, it's not going to be happy because it cannot stretch the pin. It's impossible. So I say this one and this one not parallel, force it to be coincident. Look, so what are you talking about? You want me to add this mate and break the other mates to satisfy it? Or add this mate and what? Overdefine the assembly. So you have two options, either mess up the assembly and overdefine it, or get rid of the other ones, suppress them, and add this one so that it happens. So say, okay. Break the other ones and force this one in. And you see clearly that distance that you added is now what? It's not going to be happy because the pin is not that long. It's not possible, okay? So I have added it as a separate slide for you instead of me just having something here. I added the separate slide and mentioned that you can either add the mate and break other ones or over constraint, but you should not do any of them, okay? Because you will get basically uh, mates that are conflicting and uh, you're gonna have problems. So never over constrain your assemblies. Uh, so I mentioned uh, accessing and modifying mates. Uh, another thing, that is interesting is the opposite of assembly. So this assembling, the assembly, we call it exploded view. And if this is my assembly. If I go here under exploded view and click on that. So here you can see that I can choose any component that I want and then move it or rotate it take them out step by step and add more steps to the exploded assembly. Now, uh, I recommend when you do this, do not just take the parts out and move them in any arbitrary direction. Consider it like when you do this uh, exploded view, consider it like you are making a construction manual, okay? So if you have seen many of the construction manuals or you might call instruction manuals, they have an exploded view in the beginning which shows all the parts. And then uh, you as an engineer want to show the uh, consumer that if they want to put the parts together or take the parts off, what's the way to do it, okay? So you might say, well, I click on this pin and then take the pin off in the Y direction. Well, in the real world, you cannot do that, right? The only way to take the pin out is in the Z direction. You cannot just cut these two material and take it off. So don't do that, okay? That's not a good thing to do. Although you can do anything here in the software virtually, but always try to match the real world, right? So I would say if you want to first walk, and the order also matters. So uh, I guess the first stage here is quite simple. Take the pin off. So you click on the pin and move your mouse over the Z direction and bring it out like this. Then I want you to do a right click. Do a mouse right click so that you can OK it. And now, uh, not like that, of course. Wait one more time. So here. This one, do a right click so that you can go to the next part. Then you click on this one. And now this one you can move in the X direction like that. Okay. And this should be good to go. And I okay that. So this is this assembling it. And you can have this for a construction manual or even take a video. 
I'll show you later if you want to talk about that. But um, now you might say, okay, I did that. Now I want to put it back together. What happened here? I have all these mates, but apparently they are not active. Even if I click on rebuild and I expect it to update and put those constraints back, it doesn't. In Katia, it does. If you move the components without respect to the constraint, then once you do a rebuild, it puts them all back, but not in SolidWorks. So how do I make this whole thing collapse? That's what we call it. Collapsing it, right? So that they go back and be assembled again. How? So this exploded view is a configuration, is a second configuration of the assembly. The first configuration is the assembled version. The second one is the exploded version. And we know when we have more than one configuration of something, we go under the configuration manager. And you see, now I also have what? Exploded view. And it has two steps. So if I right click on this guy, I can say what? I can say first animate collapse or just what? Directly collapse it. There we go. Right? Yes? So I can easily collapse it, and there we go. Or if I double click on it, I can get it back. And I can animate it too. Yes. And then what? I can save it as an animation. Correct? So you can clearly see how everything is done, right? So that can be quite a nice thing. Okay, now another extremely important thing is called interference detection. So that is very, very important when you make an assembly and you want to now not just have it in the software, you want to make a physical or a bunch of physical parts and then put them together and make something. You have to make sure during the operation of the assembly the parts will not have collisions. They will not hit each other. There, there is no interference. Okay, so that is extremely important to do that. So we need to go and do the interference detection, which is under the evaluate tab, not assembly tab. So it's not here. It's actually here under evaluate, and that's this guy. So you click on it and say calculate it for the whole assembly. For you. And you see it says what? No interference that's good if during the operation of this one member would hit the other member then it will give you an interference okay so this is extremely important that you do not do that okay uh, the other thing i want to talk about is this move and rotate okay so let me talk a little bit about those a little bit further uh, let's see if i talked about it yes i did and the collision detection so sometimes you have collision okay and if you have collision then this guy will take care of that so let me show you a case of a collision so in order to do that i need to make this a little bit um uh, more complicated so like for example I can make it a four bar linkage okay or no maybe I can bring in another instance of this uh, fixed component so right I go under insert and bring another one of this support and then I put it somewhere here but now i'm gonna put it right on the way of this pendulum as it um, moves so i put it somewhere like here so first thing i do is i go to the mates and make sure the back plates are both coincident then uh, i'll move this guy here now so there is no problem here, right? Because when this pendulum moves, it's not going to touch this. But if I change this coincidence and make it a distance instead. So I come and give it what? Some distance. Now it's not going to be that nice. So 
in the backward direction. Something like that would do the job for me. Yes, and then I will make this part also fixed. So consider it like an obstacle on the way. So now if I click on move, I can move this pendulum. And you see here, although it is kind of like passing through the object, nothing happens, okay? It's not going to pick on me. That Hey, these are hitting each other. Unless I say what? Collision detection. Detect if something is colliding and then what? What's your solution? Stop at the collision. So now if you do it, there we go. And even it makes a banging sound. There we go, right? You're hitting something. And that's all I can go. Or you go backwards, the same thing. Right? So many mechanisms, they have mechanical limits, right? They have dead points beyond which they cannot move. And you can find them using what? Using this method. So maybe here I say, what is the max angle of the pendulum in this mechanism before it has a collision? So how can you find that? So you move it to the limits like this and then leave it there. And then I want you to measure an angle for me. How can you measure an angle? You remember, you go to evaluate tab. And then you click on measure and I want you to measure the angle between basically this one and this one. If you can measure the angle between them that you can see it here, 44, 85 degrees between the pendulum and the vertical line. So the max angle deviation from the equilibrium is 4485 before it hits this uh, obstacle over there, right? So that can be a very useful tool. Now, if I run the interference detection one more time, okay? So uh, you can exclude components. Now, here is not really doing an easy detection. So, because the uh, interference actually in this case is a little bit different, and interference means when the parts are actually inside each other. So, right now, if you look, I made them have an interference, right? And now let's see. There we go. Since two parts are already in a collision mode or in a mode that they are on the top of each other, it cannot be physically possible. So the difference between interference and stop at collision is this. The interference detects a static case of collision or the parts overlapping. So if you move it out of the way like this and assume that there is no motion happening, then it does not detect any interference. So at the moment, there is nothing. If you move it here, again, so that now they have some interference, then yes, it will pick on you. Right? And it shows exactly where. But it does not consider that, well, here, there is no interference, but if this mechanism keeps moving, it will have an interference. So in order to do that, what you need to do is... Basically, go to move components yourself and try to move it and then what? Stop at collision and see if you ever hit any other object on the way or not. Okay, so it's a little bit different. Okay, uh, let me, as I said, talk a little bit more about move and rotate. Because... Uh, there is just more options than simply just dragging the part around and moving or rotating it. So let me talk a little bit about more options about that. So here, if I bring in a component, and it's free to move. As I said, once you click on move components, there are several modes. One of them is what? Free drag. So you can just freely drag the parts around all directions that you want, or you what? You can say, align the assembly X, Y, Zs. So if you want precisely to move a line, you see here, I'm moving it along what? Along Z of the assembly, okay? So uh, 
I can move it precisely along Y. I can move it precisely along Z. And I can move it what? Precisely along X. I'm not going to be able to move it in any arbitrary crazy direction that I want like the free drag. Okay, so free drag is kind of arbitrary all over the place. But if you say assembly X, Y, Z, that makes life a lot better. Or you can say move or rotate by delta X, Y, Z. Here you exactly provide the numbers. It's not just, it's more accurate. Not only you have the direction control, you have the amount of motion. So you say I want to move this like 5 mil in the y direction and then maybe um, 9 mil in the x direction so you type the numbers and then say what apply okay so this is way better or you can exactly move it to position x y and z now you might say what do you mean by move it move what which point of this object is at that location because different points of the object, they have different X, Y, Z points. Which point is this number? That's the centroid. Okay, so that is the centroid of the part that is at that location, not the whole part. Okay, of course, the part has too many points and each one has a different X, Y, Z. Okay, so let me show you that as well because uh, I'm not sure positive whether I talked about showing the centroid. I mentioned it, but I haven't done it. So if this is a part and I want to know where the centroid is, I want to visually see that. Of course, I showed you that. You can go to evaluate, click on mass properties, and it tells you exactly the XYZ of the centroid. But can you also show it on the top of the part? Yes, you can. So what you need to do is, okay, so this is the part, right? Correct, and I want to see if I can show the centroid. So I come here and then say what? Show me the center of mass here, right? So first you activate it, and then what? There's one more thing probably that you have to do if you remember, right? Do you remember anything under these guys that you have to show? Yes, let's see. You see anything that might be of any interest to you? Is there any way that I can show the centroid of this part? Okay, so I said if there is a centroid visible, show it. And I activated that. So it should be visible if you want to, but right now I don't see it. But if you come here under reference geometry, now you say what? Show me the center of mass. There we go. So you need to do two things. One, showing what? The, uh, clicking in under reference geometry, clicking on center of mass, and then under this eye, you also make it visible. Now, if you change this object, that location will also be what? Modified accordingly, right? So for example, here, you see how it looks like? Yes, that's here. Now, if I make this hole a lot bigger, it will probably move up or down, right? So here, all I need is go and make this one, let's say, uh, 25. Make it a big hole. You see it's moving? Yes. Let me change it again. Fine. Yes. So it is going to be adaptive to the conditions, right? And it will move with the part. So this is a good feature to have for many applications, especially maybe aerospace. You want to see when you do some modification to the part, uh, what's the effect, right? For the airplane or something. If I do something, where is the center of mass, right? Where is the center of uh, the drag or uh, lift forces and so on. So these are really important about the stability of the aircraft. So this is good for visualization. So if I come back here, as I mentioned, you can move the object, but again, which point of the object? The centroid of the object, you move it to a specific position. 
And as I said, you can move exactly by amount delta x delta y delta z and then click apply. You can move it along an entity, okay? Rotation of uh, about an entity can be really nice. So sometimes, let me talk about rotation about an entity. Sometimes uh, the axis of the rotation for an object is not aligned x, y, or z. In this case, it is because this is aligned z axis. So if I want to rotate this object and go under rotate component, I can do free drag. Since this object is constrained to move along that axis, I don't have any problem. Although you see kind of if you do it, it's not really well managed and well controlled. The better way is to say about by delta x, delta y, delta z. So you can provide angle here. Say I want, let's say 45 degree delta z, right? So you can do it accurately. Or you can say about an entity. Okay, And here you need an axis of rotation of this object to rotate about and again in this case that axis is the same as z so when you rotate about z you have no problem but not always the object is like that sometimes the axis of rotation is not aligned any of the axes so when you say by delta x delta y delta z you're not going to get what you really expected so sometimes it's better to rotated about the entity and here the entity you want it to be the axis of rotation but you don't see any axis here unless you go under eyes and say what make temporary axis visible now you say yeah i want to rotate it about that and look now you have control over it okay so uh again in this case you don't have much of a problem because that axis is parallel to z if it's not the best way to go about rotation is rotate about an entity, okay? So hopefully that gives you a little bit more idea about different ways that you can move the object, different ways that you can rotate the object and so on and so forth, okay? Because this manipulation of the object is actually quite important in assemblies okay okay so you see again i added some placeholders for you so that remember that move and rotate they have options it's not just simply free drag uh okay what else one of the uh, things in assembly is called assembly features and this is where you can apply a feature to the entire assembly like all components of the assembly like for example you do a cut extrude and cut the entire all the members of the assembly or a few members of the assembly so instead of individually going to each one of them and do the extruded cut you can once the whole thing is assembled you can apply it okay and it's not just a cut extrude you can do a cut revolve, a cut sweep, a fillet, a chamfer, and then simple hole, hole wizard, hole series, and so on. So it's mostly cutting. Okay, so let me show you that, and then we'll talk about how to individually uh, modify each component of the assembly, and how to insert a sub-assembly, or uh, insert a simple component and make it from scratch while in assembly okay so i want to show you some more advanced options in assembly so here as i said there is one called assembly features right and that's this guy here and you can do a bunch of things so one of them is an extruded cut Okay, that you can do. By the way, your assembly itself has three planes. So not only each individual component has three planes. Also, what? Your assembly has three planes. So here, there are a ton of planes here. Three components, each one has three basic planes. And assembly does. So here, overall, you have 12 planes to access and 
remember that you can also apply mates between the planes of different components. Okay, for example, I can say I want the um, right plane of the pendulum to be coincident with what? With right, uh, cannot be with right plane of the assembly, the entire right plane of the assembly. I want these two to be what? Parallel. And look. If I do that, what do you think will leave for the pendulum to move? Nothing, because it could only rotate now since I forced this mid plane of the pendulum to be what? Parallel to the mid plane of assembly, this guy is going to be completely fixed. You see, it says it's fully defined. As I force it now to keep a fixed distance from a plane. Okay, so don't forget that you can always apply constraints between the planes of individual components or individual components and what? The planes of the assembly itself. So you can use those two. It's not just necessarily the edges or uh, vertices or faces of the components. You can do it on the basic planes. So here I get rid of this so it still can move. Now, the important thing is this. If you want to do, let's say, extruded cut for all of the assembly, then on which plane should you draw the sketch? So here I want to draw a circle like this and then cut both members with it. So the circle should be drawn on which plane? On a plane inside the pendulum or the support or pin or where? The answer is none. It should be only done on what? On one of the three planes of the assembly. So never come here on these planes or on the surface, let's say. Because if I choose the surface, the surface belongs to member one pendulum. And when I create a sketch, that the sketch will not be added to the entire assembly. It will be added under what? Under pendulum. So you see that sketch right below this bus extrude one. And I cannot choose it to cut the entire assembly. Okay. Or if I choose this face to start my sketch, then that sketch does not belong to the whole assembly. It belongs to the support member. So do not use the faces here use one of these three planes. So I want to go to this front plane here. And if they are not suitable, you can always go and use the reference geometry and customize a plane, right? So let me show you that. If that's not the plane that you want to use, you always can go under what? Reference geometry and basically get the plane that you want, create one. Like that maybe. Okay, or make it 85 or anything for that matter. Okay, 86 maybe. So if you want it right on the top of that one, yes, I get 86 will do the job for you. Okay, so now the difference is this plane does not belong to that pendulum. You see, it is under the entire assembly. Now I can go on this one. I can draw a circle or any cutting profile, maybe. And then what? I can use this sketch to now go and say, do a uh, extruded cut for me. Okay, and I make it through all. And then I OK that. There we go. Look. You see? I could cut the entire assembly, all the components in it. So this is good when you want to apply one single thing to all of the members. So now, a very important thing is if I have a component that needs to be modified. So I brought them all in, assembled them, and then I found that, well, there is something missing or some component needs to be modified or something. What should I do? So let's say here, if you remember, I provided a gap between these two components. And for that reason, now my pin is a little shorter than reaching from this face to this back face. There is a little bit of gap here that you can clearly see. Right? You can see the gap here. 
and that gap is just that 0.1 mil that I provided. So what if I want to make this pin 0.1 mil longer so that this gap goes away? How can I do that? Should I close my assembly, open up the pin, modify it, and then come back to assembly and update it? No. You can directly do it from here. You do not need to close this and open the part. All you need is you right click on the component to be modified and then choose what? Edit part. So now you see you're back to the part design and now this component that is needed to be modified goes blue. So now you can modify it. And if you remember this, you see this is 20 mil. So I make it 20 what? 0.1. Make it a little bit longer, and then I exit. And before anything else, I first save this. And when you save it, not only the assembly is saved, also that component you modified is saved. So everything is saved. And now, if you look here, the gap is gone. Okay? So I can modify anything that I want. Or let's say I want the color of the support to be changed. So I just right click on the support, go here, open it up, and then here I wanted this color to be modified. So I right click, go to appearance, then I change the color to something else. Now here I guess it is this one that has to be modified. So let me Get rid of that. Okay, and now exit. And now look. Yes. And when I save, you see it says not only pendulum, also the support. Save both of them. And you do. There we go. So you can do any save or modification and save without closing the assembly. Now, what's the advantage of this? The advantage is you see the effect of that modification while you can see the rest of the assembly, right? So when here I went to modify the size of the pin, I still can see the rest of the assembly. So if I made this pin too long, right? If I made it instead of 20.1, I made it 21. I could immediately see that, what? I made it longer than expect or needed. So that's the good thing. You are not just modifying completely blindfolded. You see the effect immediately on the rest of the assembly. So I always recommend you do further modifications here instead of closing it, opening the individual parts, modifying, and then coming back. So that's what you need to do. You can even provide constraints, right? So uh, with the respect to the rest of the components in the assembly. What do I mean by that? So let's say here, I decide to make this pin bigger or the hole in the uh, support a little bigger. So I go to uh, this here, and then I resize the hole in the part, right? So you see phi is 10, I make it 12, right? So I made the all bigger yes and now clearly pin has a lot of clearance which by the way you can detect with clearance verification okay so if you do the pin and then this one okay it should give you a view of the clearance right you see I have one mil of clearance here because this is 10 that is 12 so one here one here so I don't want that much of clearance. So what should I do now? I need to modify the size of the hole and the size of the pin. How do I do that? So here, I go to the pin, right click and edit. And now I need to what? Change the size of this sketch, right? So I can directly type the number, which was 12, or another thing I can do is this.
Okay, first let me hide this component if I can. So I want to hide the pendulum to get it out of the way. You see here, so let me get rid of that dimension. I want this to be the same size as that one, right? So instead of me providing a number, this is what I do. I choose this and I choose the entity from other components. And then say what? I want them co-radial, which means the same radius. Right? So now this diameter here depends on the size of the hole in the other part. There we go. Yes? So that's the advantage. You can constrain using the entities of other components too, if you don't exactly know how much they were. You can use those. And now you see I have clearance, but I can do the same thing for the pendulum, right? So I go to the pendulum, and then I go to the sketch, and all I need to do is, instead of providing this radius, right? So I took the line radius off. I say this one should be the same as that one. Unless it gives me an error like this. Okay, I can modify it. It's not a big deal. So that one and this one, make them equal. There we go. The bigger hole in the part. And I put this guy back, make it visible. Here we go. You see? So that's the power of modifying, and then you save everything. That's the power of modifying everything through assembly. That's really a good, powerful tool. Uh, the other thing is adding a component to assembly. So sometimes you need to add something to the assembly and uh, you don't have it. You haven't made it ahead of time. Can you make it right now that you are in the assembly? Or you need to close the assembly, go and create a new part and then bring and add it. No, you don't need to. Again, for the same advantage that you can see the effect on the rest of the thing, I recommend if you are missing a component, start adding a blank part and then modifying it directly in the assembly. What do I mean? So let's say here I don't have this pin. So I remove that equality with the pin, and now that the pin is gone, it is picking on me. It says, I don't know, I should be equal to what? Okay, so there we go. Now let's say I want to make a little better pin. So I want to add a pin that basically has uh, a cap here too, a little bigger, or on this side maybe. So I want to add a pin, design a pin for this pendulum and the support. How do I do that? So I go to assembly and say insert, but instead of an existing component, I say create a new part for me. And it says, sure, why not? So it added this part for me. Okay, which is called part two from assembly. So we give it the name itself, part two. Okay, and I mentioned that here. Uh, now, one of the things is whenever you add a component inside the assembly, uh, uh, SOLIDWORKS makes it fixed. 
you don't want it fixed, you right click and say what? Make it float, okay? So that's one of the important things. So first, you can rename it. And as I said, you can make it float. So it was fixed, but you can float it. You can also right click on it and rename the component. You see, you rename the part. So I would call it pin or rivet or anything you want and enter. Okay, so now the name of this part is called rivet. And now I can, it's right now it's blank. If you open it, there is nothing in it. Okay, it's completely blank. But now I can go and make something. So I right click and say edit part. And then now I can do some stuff. So I can go to the front plane of this new part, go to sketch, and then create a uh, rivet element. So I make sure this one and this one are equal. Right. And then I will extrude that. Like this. Then I come here to this and add a little bigger circle as well. Like this. Okay. So now if I say save, it asks me, hey, do you want this new file that you just started here? Do you want it to be saved externally or internally? Internally means you will never get an SLDPRT file outside this file for it. Okay, you will not see an external SOLIDWORKS file in your folders. It will be saved, like remember the design table that we had in the previous lecture? It wasn't an external Excel file, it was an embedded Excel file. So it, this is gonna be an embedded SOLIDWORKS part, not an external one. I don't recommend you do it. I always recommend you save it externally in the location that you want. So now if you go to that folder, you should be able to see the rivet component. And now that you got this part and it's movable and you name it properly, now you will mate it with the rest of the thing. Like that. And finally, this one and this one coincident. There we go. And save it. And now this is a different component. You see? If you want, you can add another one over here too, right? So feel free to uh, practice with this thing and learn exactly what you need to be doing. So here, I add something similar to the other one. There we go. Okay, make it more realistic. So, I hope I could uh, get you the basics so far. Oh, something is not happy. This coincidence. Suppress it. Okay. Um, what else? Another thing is inserting a sub assembly. So not always your assembly is a small assembly like this with three, four components. Sometimes you have a huge 
assembly and each assembly has a lot of sub assemblies right if you have a car a car has up to 30,000 components you're not going to bring them one by one and then put them together because uh, it's just too much too uh, daunting task you have to divide and concur so what you do you can see there each uh, sub assembly here to be one part of your car one is like the engine one to be the transmission one to be the drive shaft and drivetrain the other one to be suspension tires the uh, sitting area right the steering mechanism so you have so many sub assemblies and then you bring them into the major assembly which is the car and then you assemble them together too so instead of bringing in a uh, component which either is from blank uh, basically you start it from scratch it's a blank and you make it or bring an existing one you can say what bring an entirely new assembly and here that will be a sub assembly of this one so um, let's say in this case let me, although it's not super relevant, but I'll just want to show you something. So I make an assembly here. And let's say my mechanism has two of this uh, pendulum assembly. So look, I'm bringing the whole pendulum assembly into this assembly. You see, so my entire big assembly is called assembly two right now. But one component of that is an assembly itself called pendulum and then I can bring one more of that if I want to um, another one bring that here too and I even made a, a basically blank assembly so I clicked on the new assembly and then it gave me a blank assembly that now I have to go rename it add components to it and so on so let me take care of this because i don't need that but you can create basically what an assembly from scratch too or add an existing assembly and now each one of them as i said is a sub assembly of the major one okay so this could be your engine this could be the transmission and so on and so forth and then that could be your car okay and again you bring an existing one or you go and create a new blank one and then start from scratch okay now the part that i always like to talk about are advanced mates so the mates that i have done for you so far they were too simple i've done a parallel for you a coincidence you can do a perpendicular you can do concentric you can provide a gap between two planes you can provide an angle between two planes and you can lock a component let me talk a little bit about angle and lock components, but you have a lot more in SOLIDWORKS to talk about. There are advanced mates, which are really good, and we'll talk about them here. And then there are mechanical mates, which are the best. Okay, so there are a bunch of different mates. The ones that we have been talking about are standard mates, but we can do a lot better. So let me show you a little bit about uh, more advanced meeting so um, let me open up that assembly and show you a couple of things Let me get rid of all of the constraints for the moment being. And maybe even the rivets. Let's just focus on these two parts. So here, uh, let's say I want this uh, plane of the pendulum to be at some angle with respect to this plane. So I choose them and then go to mates. And instead of coincidence, I say I want an angle. And then you provide your angle. Okay? So you say I want them at 45 degree angle. And that's what you will get. 
right? So now if you move this, that 45 degree angle always remain. You can never make this pendulum vertical anymore, right? So you have an angle constraint. The other thing that you have is called lock. So lock means keep the part in the current position and orientation, regardless of whether they are uh, properly defined or not. Freeze it in this position and orientation, okay? And do not let anything happen to it. So if I choose this guy and go to mate, the only option I have for the entire part is to what? To lock it. So let's say that's fixed. I choose this component and say what? Lock it, freeze it in that orientation and position. Okay? It says please select entities to mate. So lock it with respect to this one. Okay? You have to have with respect to something. And since this was fixed, I can lock it with respect to that. Now, look, if I try to move it, nothing happens. If I try to rotate it, nothing happens. Because that was fixed and this is locked. It's like you're welding it, basically. You're welding it in this configuration and you don't let it move. I don't recommend you ever use lock unless temporarily you want something to be fixed to somewhere and then later you come back at it and fix the mates, okay? So it's just a temporary fixation of the part, but, or you can just simply say fix it for me, okay? Or fix, so the difference is fixed, basically fix it in the beginning, but uh, the lock will basically first, you just do a little bit of manipulation. So first you do a rough positioning and orientation and then temporarily so you see I'm not gonna make them perfectly coincident I just bring them quite close and then try to also move this kind of like that yeah so I kind of do it manually not really they are not perfectly concentric or coincident and then maybe I need to do something first then come back at this so if I don't want this position and orientation of this part to be messed up with and anybody change it, I say, well, uh, I want you to lock this with respect to that. Okay, now you have to make sure that you're not selecting faces. You have to select the entire part. So I choose the entire part and go to mate and say mate it with respect to this entire part and lock it in the current configuration now we cannot do anything to it but later you come back and release the rot lock either delete it or suppress it and do the proper constraint okay so it's not really a good constraint method uh, the other thing is opposite and the same direction for uh, some of the constraints that's another important thing so I want this face to be coincident with this one, okay? It has two options if you go down for mate alignment. You either make the two normal to the planes in the same direction or what? Opposite direction. Anti-aligned is when they are sitting on the top of each other. Aligned is when they both face the same direction. So here, they have to be anti-aligned, okay? If you do this, look what happens. Those two faces will be coincident, and the normal to them, if you draw a vector normal to this and a vector normal to that, they both point in the same direction, in this case, z-axis, right? So if sometimes you might need anti-aligned, sometimes aligned, but if they sit on the top of each other, you definitely need anti-align. Okay, so if you see them, they are not properly oriented, make sure to change the mate alignment. Okay, so that's another option. Good, so I talked about these. Now, as I said, we have advanced mates and mechanical mates. So advanced mate, there are several of them. Profile center, symmetric, wet, pad mate, and linear coupler. Okay, and I want to show a few of them to you. 
what I would like to show you is WET and PADME right now. And then inside the class, I'll talk about symmetric profile center and linear coupler. Okay, so I'll show you items number three and four right now, and I'll do one, two, and five later on. Because there are lots of them and we have to practice. And mechanicals also, there are several of them, seven. And what I want to show you today is the screw mate and then the gear mate. Okay, and then uh, if you want, I can show you the rest of them later. So let's look at two out of each and then we practice later. So first, uh, the wet. This is a really good, nice feature. I really like this because instead of several um, basic constraints, it does it with one. What do I mean by that? Let me show you. So uh, let me modify this uh, support so that you can see what I mean by that. So here, um, I will go on this face and add something. Say I do this for 20. Okay, and then I come on this one, do another sketch, and then I project that sketch right here. Get out and extrude it for 10 more mil. So I make my support to look like that. Yes. Now, what I want is I bring this pendulum and put it right in between the two faces of this gap, like here. I don't want it close to one or closer to the other one. I want it exactly in between. Okay, so I need to exactly know how much the gap is. I make one parallel to one surface and provide the gap. Instead of that, I can do this. I say go to Mate, go to Advanced, use wet and then you choose the two outer faces like this one and this one and then here you choose the two inner faces this one and this one and it forced them to be exactly in the middle okay let me move it a little bit so that you can see when it's changing so i'll do it one more time this one and this one, and here, this one, and this one. Did you see? It moved to exactly in between. Now, you cannot move this any more out of that. If I, let me update this and see it from the top, or maybe from the bottom, actually. Okay, I cannot move it up and down. It should always stay here in the middle. So that is one good thing to do. The other one I wanted to mention is the uh, pathme. This is really good if you have one object moving inside another object, or you have an object moving inside a guide or a groove. This is really good to force the object to follow the path of the groove. Okay, that is really a powerful tool. So uh, let me show you. So here I bring in one of the parts that I already made, the groove. And then now I need a disc, a small disc to move inside this, right? So I need to import it into an assembly, not open it as a simple part. Right, so first I bring that in, and then here I also need to create a blank part, and I make that part movable, float, and then I also rename it and call it disk. 
then I go inside this disk and I will update it and add something. Because right now it's completely blank, right? So I go here, I draw a circle, and you see here the advantage is again, I make sure that the circle is not so big that it cannot fit inside the groove, right? So I just make something up and then uh, I give it some thickness like that. I apply a color to it. The other thing I need is on the top of this uh, groove, I uh, disk, I need a single point. I'll tell you why, but exactly at the center of that, add a single point. We need that and exit and then save it. Save your disk externally. Call it disk. You also need to show the center curve of this groove because this point is supposed to follow that curve. So you need to go to the groove and make sure that the center curve is visible. Okay, so here this one has a sketch and that sketch has the center groove. So if I make it visible, hopefully, right, it will do the job or I can basically uh, come to the top surface here because I want this disk, this point is on the top of the disk. So I'll create the same curve on the top face. And so I will choose this and I will uh, convert it. Right, and now I can hide the original sketch. Yes, so you make sure you have the curve, a line, and then a point that follows the line. And now you go to Mates, Advanced Mates, and then you click on the Path Mate here. And then it is asking you to basically choose the vertex and then choose the path, okay? And now you have some options. Do you want the path to be constraint free? Do you want to just go a distance along the path or percent along the path? Do you want the angles to be controlled or something and so on? So if you don't and okay that, what happens? So now when I move this, first of all, it can get out of the pad range because I did not, uh, it basically extended. If it's not a closed sketch, consider it, uh, if it's open, it closes it theoretically and then allows the point to move on the closed uh, form of the sketch. And then the angles are basically not controlled. So this one just moves all over. So here I added something to tell you exactly how to control it so that it does not get out of the uh, path that you specified and also how to control the angle. So what you need to do is I basically add a, a coincidence between this top face of the disc and top face of the groove here. So first of all, this way the angles are controlled. It's not all over the place. Second is I go back to this pad mate and then when I wanted to choose this path, okay, I click on the selection manager because typically, again, as I said, it considered the curve to be a closed loop. So if you don't, it chooses that for you like that. But if you say, no, I really want this curve to be the open curve here, right? And um, let's see that and then choose it. Okay. So is tell it, hey, it's an open curve and that's this guy. Use that. Do not close it yourself. And okay, that. Now look, when you move this, it comes to the end point and it locks. It does not go any further. Okay. So you can use the selection manager and that will help to keep it completely constrained. 
So this is the path constraint, very useful for many mechanisms. And um, finally, I have mechanical mates for so many mechanical elements, slot, cam, hinge, gear, rack, and pinion, which is another type of gear, but it converts rotary motion to translation instead of rotation to rotation. You have bolts and screws and knots and then universal joint. So here I'm going to show you a couple of them, namely uh, bolts and knots and then two gears. So let me show you an example of a bolt and knot. So here I go to assembly again, and then I bring a bolt and a knot with the same size that I got from the toolbox. Okay, so I bring the bolt here and then bring the knot. Again, I got them directly from the toolbox, which helps me really. And now I make these two guys first concentric. Okay, but now if you look, the, uh, if I fix the bolt or fix the knot, one of them, right? Let's say most of the, uh, let's say I fix the bolt, that's fine. So when I rotate the knots, the amount of motion of the knots does not depend on how much you rotate it. So there is no real constraint and it can go out in and there is nothing really other than a cylindrical constraint or that concentric that you make. But you can apply that by going to mates and then mechanical ones and say I want this kind of uh, mate screw and then you say I want to tell you how far it goes based on one revolution. So if I rotate this, how far the knot should move on the bolt. And as I told you, that distance that it moves forward or backward for one revolution is called what? Pitch. And pitch was the distance between one crest or one root of the thread to the next one. Now these guys are both one quarter of an inch thread. So you have to make sure that this is 0.25 inches this is how much the knot will move on the bolt or vice versa if you rotate one of them uh, one full revolution and you okay that and now look okay uh, oh it, i didn't apply it apparently let me make sure i'm applying it scroll between what and what between this one and this one, and then 0.25 inches. Okay, now it is applied, and now if I move this, you see, it's not gonna be like it can move freely one while also being spinned. The amount of advance if you take two snapshots, one here and one when you rotate this point one full revolution and measure the distance of, let's say, this front face with respect to here, right? So let's say here, uh, if I right now measure this distance between them in this face and this face, it says it is 6.41, right, which is a quarter of an inch. Now, if I rotate it one more full revolution, like this, and now look at the distance, you see it's almost zero, right? So it was exactly a quarter of an inch advancement for one revolution of the knot, okay? So this is a bolt and a knot or a screw uh, constraint, which is really good and useful. Uh, the other one is gears. So if you have two gears, how do you make sure that the gears are uh, mated properly? And so that the number of RPMs Right, the number of rotations per minute of gear one over gear two or input gear over output gear is the same as what? The inverse of the diameters or inverse of the number of teeth. 
So the bigger gear basically rotates slower, the smaller gear rotates faster, right? So in this case, basically what I have is, if I go to assembly and then uh, bring in the two gears. So I have two gears here, both the same modulus. One is two times bigger than the other one. So if you remember, first of all, when two gears want to be assembled, the moduli have to be the same. Now, uh, it also messed up the... Well, it seems like one is a scale version of the other. Okay, so I don't think I did it properly. Let me bring another one of this input gear. And by the way, I want them uh, not fix, I want them float. So let's bring two gears of the same size. I'll show you later one in class where I do it between two different gears with different sizes. So I'll bring one more copy of this. So let's say they are the same size. And now I want to make them. The first thing is you need to make sure these guys are both uh, coincident. So you make them to be coincident. And another good thing to do is if you can make both of these also coincident with a plane of the assembly, like the right plane here. So I make both of them to also come forward and be coincident with the right plane of assembly. Now, uh, the other thing you want to do is to make sure that the centers of the two gears are fixed, so they only spin in place. And then the distance between them is exactly equal to the diameter of one divided by two or the radius of one plus the radius of the other one. If the center to center distance is anything other than that, then you have a lot of clearance. All of the gears are too close, they will jam. So exactly the center to center distance should be radius one plus radius two. Which radius? Radius of the pit circle. Now in this case, uh, these gears are uh, modulus of 0.5 and there are 16 teeth okay? or a diametral pitch of 0.5 actually so diametral pitch p which is n over d for these gears both is equal to um, 0.5 and they have 16 teeth therefore d for both of them is 32 inches Okay, so this guy is 0.5 teeth. Per inch. So the diameters are 32. So radius are 16. And since they are the same thing, so if the distance center to center is exactly 32 inches, I should be fine. So now this is what I do. I go on the right plane. I create a sketch where the sketch is simply two points and then what? A line, a center line connecting them. So I start at any point I want. Let's say I put one point at the origin. The other point, I move it horizontally with respect to origin and then make sure the center to center distance is exactly uh, 32 inches, right? And I don't even need the line, really. So these two points are sufficient for me. Let's see now. Or uh, maybe I need circles, too. We'll see. So if I say now, mate, that curve with this point. No, it does not. You need a circle. So the uh, point cannot be, of course, concentric with the circle. So I need circles here. So what I really need is... And again, the center line is not needed. I'm just adding it for the sake of demonstration. So I add a circle here with a diameter of 32 inches. Make it for, for um, make sure that this guy is for construction because I don't need to uh, use them for any other purpose. And then I do a similar thing here right and 
Again, this guy has to be the same, 32 inches diameter, and I want it also for construction. And make sure that these guys are tangent. I guess clearly they are. So now you go and say, well, I want this curve to be concentric with this one. And then I want this curve to be concentric with this one. So first you put them on the actual locations. So now they only spin in place. Finally, uh, put the teeth in such an angle that there is no interference. Okay, so put them like this. And now you can apply the gear mate. So go here to mate, mechanical, gear, and it says which two gears. You say this gear with this edge and this gear with that edge. And then it says, okay, what is the ratio? And you say the ratio is the diameter to diameter, or you can say one to one. In this case, the RPMs are one to one, right? Or if it doesn't like it, you can choose the, uh, basically, the circumference of the circles. That's fine. Okay, and now if you okay that, look what happens. So now they are not going to be independently of each other spinning. Look, see, there will be no interference anymore, and they exactly spin the way they should. And as I said, the ratio of the RPMs so if one of them is gear one and the other one is gear two. So you have one here, and then you have another one here. And if this radius or diameter is, uh, let's say here, I call it diameter. So this one is D1 and it has N1 teeth. And this one is D2 and it has N2 teeth. This one rotates with RPM1 or angular velocity 1. And this one rotates with angular velocity 2. Then I can show you that omega 1 over omega 2 is equal to D2 over D1, and it's equal to N2 over N1, and this ratio, I call it what? I call this the speed ratio 